This is an insect killing lamp. Now, I'm going to warn you in advance that because of the uh, way this, uh, the LEDs are driven in this, it's quite flickery. It's actually rival flickery to the slow multiplex display of the Hoppy, which looks absolutely rock solid to you, but to the camera does not look rock solid at all. It flickers. Uh, so let's try this lamp. And when I plug it in, the ultraviolet like LEDs, it's kind of, you know, it's not blue. The LEDs in the bottom here. I shouldn't be poking my finger through here because this is live. Let me demonstrate that it's kind of live by going like that. Uh, where is it there? Oh yeah, yeah. Lots of lots of electricity in there. Oh, did the hoppy meter change there? Hold on, let me. Uh... It changed a little bit. I think it was just the burst as it was charging up. But anyway, uh, when you first power it up, it comes up at eight watts. And while I was looking at the package for this, the Chinglish package. Oh, it's kind of stopped flickering. That's nice. Uh, when I was looking at, at the package, I was looking for Chinglish, and it says no more than the ground 1.5 metres, the effect is better. That's absolutely fine. It's not perfect gram, but it's fine. Last two. Let's finish that off for them. Hours. It will probably last longer than that. Electric hazard kids don't touch. Uh -huh, well, how else are they going to learn? Colour temperature 6500K. Um, and then it says, both can lighting, also can kill mosquitoes. Three channel control, don't have to change the power switch. And I was thinking, does this really have three channel control? Is it one of these that when you turn it off and on, it changes intensity? So watch the display, it goes from eight watts, if I turn it off and put it back on again, it goes down to about four and a half watts. And if I turn it off and on again, just the ultraviolet LEDs are on. So uh, that's quite interesting. Also, the hoppy displays its naughty trait. If the power goes below a certain level, and it's not going to be much for the LEDs in there, it will just display zero. It won't even display current, even though current should be flowing and there should be a really crap power factor right now. It's a bit naughty that way. It also does the same thing when you test it with um, highly capacitive loads. If the load is almost pure capacitance, the hoppy meter won't even attempt to read that. Someone's asking where I got the hoppy meter from. It came from eBay, but uh, I haven't seen them so much recently. So uh, I've, I couldn't honestly say how readily available they are, but it's H-O-P-I, and this model number is HP-9800, although in hindsight, I should have got the one that wasn't rated 20 amps. I should have got the lower rated one because uh, it's more accurate. But that's okay, this is the one I've got, and it makes it suitable for a wide range of loads. So other things that are worth noting about this lamp. When you unplug it, even if you leave it for a modest length of time, it still holds a charge just in case you poke your fingers in. So let's open it up. Let's get the pink test socket out of the way. Let's push the hoppy to the side. And... pops off. I don't think that screws off. It does look like it's got a screw thread. No, maybe it just pops. It has popped. There's the LED circuit board. The LED circuit board has a lot. What is that chip? Just two wires come up to there. If there's just two wires come up to here, that means that the uh, intensity control must be up here. But how does it then control the ultraviolet LEDs, the, or purple LEDs. Odd. Are these multi-chip LEDs as well? There's one way to find out, and that's to bring a meter in, stick it to the diode test, and put it across and see if one of those LEDs lights. I think it's going to be multi-chip LEDs because it looks like a type of driver that is in series the long string of LEDs. Yeah. I'm not getting that LED to light, so... That suggests it's multi-chip LED, which would make sense because these things are better for large strings of LEDs. I kind of want to power that up again now and measure the voltage across those LEDs. Can I do that in a safe manner? Where is the main circuit? There's the start of the LED circuit. If I was to get my shades on... Yeah, hold on. Let's get the super dark shades in. Uh, and let's get the socket back. And we'll put that up to full power, and then we'll measure the approximate DC voltage across that. So let's screw this in here. 
put this down in a convenient position that I can probe across those connections. This is just going to be so springy. Keep in mind this will be live. Right, okay, let's plug that in. Swamp the camera out, get my shades on over my existing glasses, which is quite handy because they're sort of welding or brazing shades. Forgot about the beanie, but that's okay. They're now stuffed under the beanie. And let's see if I can actually probe in there without blowing everything to shit. Let's put this to 200 volts, I think. I'm guessing it might be six chips per LED, or no, it might be three chips per LED. I'm not really sure. I guess we'll find out once I probe into it. Let's uh, see if I can not do something really terrible to this. Oh, this is actually quite hard to probe. Because it's wobbly. It's moving about. And it's quite hard to get onto the connection there. Hold on, I almost had it. It's 172 volts. Okay, shades off. 172 volts. How many LEDs do we have here? We've got... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 172 divided by 12. 172 volts divided by 12 equals 14 volts divided by roughly 3 volts equals... Oh, about, probably about 4 or 5 chips in each of those LEDs. I wonder if that was actually driving them at full output. Or no, because, you know, it was strobing earlier on, so that's not actually a great way to test that. I shall explore that later on. I shall analyse it with a resistor and the bench power supply and get a more accurate result. So let's uh, go a bit further into this. Now I've had that on, I should remember to discharge the live metal work. Yeah, it's discharged. That's good. So how's this going to come out now? Can I spudge this out, or is this going to come out? Another thing I noticed, uh, this plastic ring here. Ooh, that's promising. Uh, this plastic ring here, on the cover here, it's shown as a purple ring, which is quite nice. And then I looked at the other bits. Where is it? Where is it? Uh, I'm not seeing it now. Oh, there it is on the end. Look at the end, you can get it with a white body, blue body, orange body, or yellow body. I wish I'd known that. I'd have chosen either orange or yellow, because they're quite lurid. Yes. Oh, this one is supposed to be... Oh. It's doing that. This is supposed to be a 15 watt light. It's not 15 watts. It's half as usual. Right, okay, is this discharged? Stick the fingers in, stick the fingers in. Didn't get a shock, it's discharged. How does this circuit board come out? Slightly grubby circuit board at the bottom. Oh, you know what? I don't think I'm going to easily get access to those wires. Am I going to be able to get some snips in there and just chop those wires? Because uh, they're being held. What if I pop this uh, end bit off? Can I spudge that out? Yes, I can. The spudger works to remove those studs. I'm experimenting since uh, YouTube has withdrawn the uh, video editing uh, facility on YouTube itself. I'm experimenting with uh, some software on Android. And the good news is the software I'm trying at the moment may actually allow me to tweak the audio volume. Because a lot of people say the audio is quite quiet, but I have a horrible feeling. That's largely down to my bassy voice and small speakers. This looks promising. It's out. This is nice. I like this. I like it just on its own as a sort of open frame. You could have all the live circuitry inside. That's kind of pointless. What do we have? We have... The LEDs. I'm seeing a capacitor next to the LEDs. I'm guessing the LEDs are in the series with a capacitor across them. With the bridge rectifier for the LEDs and a capacitor for just for the LEDs themselves. And then th this capacitor here will most likely be across the main external tabs. We can test that. 
Let's bring in the metering test right now. It's one of these annoying circuit boards that has the tracks underneath the white uh, solder resist. That's quite annoying. So, the two tabs going through are here, and I'm guessing one of them may be connected. One's connected there. So that's the main capacitor that holds a charge uh, across the grid. I'm guessing that one of these other capacitors will uh, pump that up. It will form a voltage uh, multiplier to boost that voltage up, which makes the 400 volt of that quite rating quite low, because it will go probably to about 600 volts across that. And the other one, are these both the same value? They're 220 nano. So yeah, I'm guessing one of these uh, is for the LEDs. One of them is forming a voltage multiplier, possibly, with these diodes here. In which case it would be this one is the multiplier one and that is the LED one. Right, I'm going to have to reverse engineer this uh, and find out what that chip is. What is that chip? What's its number? Because all we've got here... I'm, I'm guessing that the LEDs are just lit all the time. Uh, I'm guessing then that the supply comes in here, goes through the bridge rectifier, it's got a discharge resistor across that. Then it's got the chip itself with current sense resistors. One current sense resistor. It's uh, the... Right, okay, it's got a position for... I wonder if this is one of the dual section because... Okay. Uh, what is this called? SM2213EA. SM2213EA. I'm not sure if you're actually going to see that, but we'll have a go anyway. Right, I'm going to explore this and I'm going to reverse engineer the circuit board. I shall be back in a moment. The reverse engineering is complete and it's really quite neat. This uh, lighting board, because it's two distinct separate sections, so we'll look at the lighting board first. The LEDs are, have six chips each. I used a resistor in the power supply to power one LED and turned it up until they started to glow and as soon as they started to glow I could see there were six chips neatly formed in it anyway uh, if that's the LED it was actually like little points of light like that inside they were quite well spread apart so each chip uh, has a combined voltage of about 18 volts so there's 12 of these six chip LEDs 72 chips total comes to about 216 volts so when you consider the rectified, well, this is designed for roughly 200 to 240 volts. It means that the resistive dropper chip here, I say resistive, it's, it's technically speaking a current regulating chip, but effectively it's using the transistors inside in the, what they'd call the linear region, which is they're neither fully on or fully off. So it's almost like an active electronic resistor. And uh, there's another clever trick here. So they've got these LEDs in series, and this chip is actually designed to control two channels. And it's designed so that when you turn it on at the wall, you can then choose between three colours. You can choose uh, a warm white, uh, a sort of middling white, and then a cold white. And the way it does that is it has two circuits of LEDs connected to it. And the clue to that is down here. The whole sheet is, a uh, data sheet is in Chinese, unfortunately, so I, I should really get the phone. The last time I tried setting Google Translate on my phone, it just said that uh, Chinese language translation is not available in your country. There's a weird thing. Because I live in the Isle of Man, a lot of apps are just not enabled for the Isle of Man for some reason. Google seems to struggle with the Isle of Man in some way. But anyway, uh, it's got... Uh, an arrangement here where you can have two circuits of LEDs and it suggests using the high colour temperature ones, uh, which the cold white ones, 6,500K, and then also the really warm ones, 2,700K. And when you initially turn it on, the first channel lights, and I'm guessing it must be, because they light instantly at full brightness, I'm guessing it must be uh, channel two lights here. And it lights at full brightness. And then you turn it off and on again, both the channels light, and that gives the mix of the two whites to give the intermediate colour temperature. But it's also notable that when you first turn it on, one channel is powered up to 30 milliamps. Uh, but when you turn it on for the second time and both channels light, it cuts the current down to 15 milliamps. And they're using that trick for the intensity control as well. And the third time you turn it off, it switches on the other colour, which isn't used. It's The LEDs are not here, the resistor's not here. So effectively, it's putting that channel on, but it's not in use, so the LEDs go off. So by doing that, uh, they allow the full intensity when you turn it on, 
Turn it off and on again, it goes down to the half intensity, which would have been the colour mixing, because it's cut the current to half, and then turn it off and on again, the other channel uh, turns on, which, and this channel turns off, and that means the lights go out. But the ultraviolet LEDs in the voltage multiplier circuitry remains active all the time that it's powered. It's very clever. This chip here has two capacitors. One of them will be a power supply capacitor, one will be a timing capacitor, and that will detect when it's been turned off and on again if one of the capacitors is fully discharged uh, but the other one is holding the sort of reservoir then that's how it will detect the sort of time uh, that the power's been turned off and on again it will increment the counter inside to the mode so the circuit board is almost textbook here in the sense that it's a very nice circuit board I have to say the power comes in uh, and goes straight on to the bridge rectifier the slight difference is here they've put a 1 mega ohm resistor after the bridge rectifier I'm not sure why they could have put it anywhere, I suppose, but that's where they put it. And I'm guessing the reason they've put that there is to stop ghosting, where you get slight leakage between the switch wires of a circuit. And that capacitive coupling uh, is enough to make long, super efficient strings of LEDs glow. This is going to have a near unity power factor when the LEDs reach their sort of forward voltage to light, because the, it is almost like a resistor and sears the LEDs. Uh, the other thing, there's a 100 ohm, a 100k resistor here, which I'm guessing is the power supply and also used for monitoring the voltage, the actual sine wave. Um, although, having said that, what am I talking about the sine wave? It's not switching any multiple circuits like some of the other ones do. It's just one circuit. So it will be monitoring the voltage across this sense resistor and by varying that sense resistor there, uh, and that's this little resistor here, by increasing the value of that, the current would drop because the voltage across it would rise much faster. It's textbook, the way it's been implemented. I really do like the circuit board. I probably said that before. I'm going to say it again. The layout of the tracks on it is not very visible. Um, hold on, let's see if I can bring this up and show you. Let's try and focus on this board. Is it going to show the, the layout of the tracks there? is very smart. It's They've all been optimised for covering the maximum area for coupling heat into the copper, but they've also gone a bit stylish as well, just for the sake of it, because there are bits that don't need to dissipate heat, but they've done it anyway, just because, well, they could, and it's quite smart. Let's focus back down there. Next comes the voltage multiplier section, which is this bit. So it's the power supply for the five LEDs inside, the sort of ultraviolet LEDs, and it's also uh, the voltage multiplier for the high voltage on this two layer grid, which is a inner mesh and an outer mesh. And if the insects bridge between it, they get zapped. So I've reverse engineered that. Let's bring in the, the paperwork I used to do that. I, because it's white uh, screen print, uh, solder resist, should I say, it makes it very hard to see the tracks underneath. I had to meter a lot of them out or hold it to the light in specific angles. But here is how it breaks down. Again, it breaks down into two distinct sections. It's got the LED driving section, which is a standard capacitive dropper LED driver. It's got a 220 nanofarad capacitor with an 820k discharge resistor. That's uh, these here. You can't see the resistor because it's underneath this capacitor. Uh, so it goes to the bridge rectifier, which is over here. Quite convoluted, it really jumps about. And then the output of that uh, goes to the uh, smoothing capacitor, which is a 10 microfarad capacitor here. There's a 75k resistor across that, which is presumably to stop the ghosting LEDs again, although to be honest, I wouldn't be too bothered if it just glowed gently uh, at night. There's then a 300 ohm resistor in series with just five LEDs, and I did the maths. Based on the typical forward voltage of these LEDs being around about, say, at worst, 3 volts. Uh, in reality, yes, it probably will. It probably runs them at about 15 milliamps. They'll be somewhere 2.5 to 3 volts. So that's uh, about uh, 15 volts across that. Um, and roughly, I would say, well, let's say 20 milliamps with that value of capacitor. So that would give a power dissipation from the LEDs or a power rating effectively of the lamp of the 15 volts across the LEDs times about 20 milliamps at best. It's going to be about 0.3 watt. That's why it didn't show up. It really is very, very low. It's less than half a watt. So that covers the ultraviolet LEDs. 
they have that, uh, well, I already pointed out that 75k resistor. Um, okay, I won't point that out again. Right, moving on. Then we have the voltage multiplier. The voltage multiplier is a classic sort of Walton Cockroft type sort of thing. It's got this uh, small 220 nanofarad, that's this one here, uh, limiting the current in each half cycle. It's, it lets a portion through, and effectively, on as the polarity changes, this capacitor uh, charges up, and then when the polarity changes, it doubles the voltage because then this end of the capacitor, which is fully charged already, uh, then rides up on the heart, the voltage of the mains when the polarity changes and it pushes that current. And it's not helped by the fact if these diodes were pointing in the opposite direction, it would have made it look more obvious, you know, the charge going through that diode and then being pushed through that diode onto this capacitor. But it's kind of done in the same style with the negative ion generator with the diodes all pointing down to the AC end. But either way, uh, it charges this capacitor up to probably about 600, 660 volts, which is a bit naughty because it's a 400 volt capacitor, 330 nanofarad, but it's currently limited, limited, so even if it failed, it wouldn't be too dramatic. And then there is a 20 mega ohm resistor across that. Now it's 206, 20, and six zeros, and it's not a very big resistor, but that one has uh, got about 600 volts across it, which is a uh, bit naughty perhaps. Uh, but that's then the high voltage. Now, you notice that the grids, one side of the grid is actually directly connected to one pole of the mains here. Um, I'm not sure why I'm drawing that. So I'll just make, an, I'll make a, that's a special mains symbol. It's tartan mains symbol. But it's connected to one leg. And I wondered, have they done, given you could poke your finger through that, have they made the outside connected to the main site? Or because the other one is connected via, at the very least, well, it's connected via diodes so it's not that great but it's slightly safer the, the outer one is connected uh, it's this one here so it, technically speaking it's connected via diodes it does pose a risk but not as quite as high as the outer one just being connected to the full AC mains and that didn't make that much sense but that's okay so um, it's quite a nice arrangement the cluster of LEDs that do seem to be that sort of deep violety colour. It's not phosphor ultraviolet, uh, phosphor violet. It is. It does look like uh, just a fairly deep uh, near ultraviolet colour. It makes me wonder, given that that colour doesn't really attract insects, it makes me wonder if they'd have been better standing those LEDs up and sort of pointing them out sideways. It would have been a whole load more extra work. And just using bright white LEDs, just because the insects are still attracted to the sort of the bright light. Although having said that. It's just general insects. The ones that... Um, d there is a science to this. The, the ones that bite, are they really attracted to the light? Or is it the ones that don't bite are attracted to the light? Not sure. The ones that bite are kind of attracted to you because you smell really good and they want to eat you. Yeah. But anyway, I don't know how effective this is. If it's as effective as the other LED-based ones, it won't actually be very good. But it certainly looks the part. That's That's damning with faint praise, isn't it? And the circuitry design is actually pretty nice. It's okay. Uh, the whole case, the whole assembly, it's it's actually not too bad at all. The only niggle is, of course, the, this 20 mega ohm resistor being across about 600 volts and, of course, that capacitor being across 600 volts when it's rated 400 volts. Having said that, uh, and I'm not sure that's such a huge major issue given the, the sort of it's not going to feel mega catastrophically. It'll still remain lit, it just won't work. But yeah, that's quite neat. I'm particularly taken by this uh, LED circuit board. And the whole combination, the whole case, it's actually quite a nice thing altogether. So yeah, that's quite smart.